milk washed. As tiny ripples appeared in the water, she had put on the nearby ubiquitous metal military table. It seems even with spacecraft, starships and interplanetary travel, a slab of sheet metal and some legs remains universal. She hardly began to tap her fingers in rhythm of the ripples before Cookie realised what she was doing and stopped bouncing his leg. The pair shared a look before going back to whatever they were doing, which was waiting. The other universal constant. The pair sat in the Chauvanti Military Processing Centre, the place where troops, cadets and support personnel are gathered before being brought on ship and shipped off world. Their luggage had been brought in for observance and, with the heightened security risk, cadets couldn't bring any entertainment material to the waiting room. Milk thought it was all an elaborate hazing ritual. I shot him, Madia. The monotonous voice called out, as the woman stood up and walked over to the kiosk. There were probably a good thirty other people in the room with the human pair, nearly all of them Shilvanti. She was handed a tablet, a folded up jacket, and a sealed back of something before exchanging salutes and heading out the door. Milk leaned back in her seat and began counting ceiling tiles. The show had advanced far enough they only used digital clocks, so there was no comforting tick helping her count out the seconds. So she settled for putting a pair of fingers on her neck and counting heartbeats to keep sane. At 496 heartbeats, a pair of shield were called up to the desk and pointed down another doorway. At 874, a large group walked in and sat down. They looked official and were in full uniform, so Milk assumed they were just redeploying. At 3,265 heartbeats, Cookie tapped her shoulder. Milk lost count. The Irish immigrant glared at her driver as he shrugged back at her. His hands came up and began to quickly move around his centre mass, ASL. They had learned sign language when, during a training accident, one of their wingmates went temporarily deaf due to a weapon malfunction. He recovered his hearing and was back flying within a few months. The wing kept up their ASL training for when they wanted to communicate without talking. Like right now. Anyone who was caught talking in the processing room was given a stern glare and bumped down even further. So when Cookie began flashing the signs for, well, this is boring, Milk almost laughed. Leave it to the politician's kit to figure out the loophole in whatever order he's given. She quickly signed back. No kidding. You think they'd let us at least have a book or tablet? Security my ass. Cookie nodded. It's a test. I notice most of the folks here aren't in uniform and don't look like soldiers. I'm thinking it's an endurance test to weed out the weak. Until we get our cadet jackets, we can legally leave at any point and break the contract without reprisal. Milk raised an eyebrow. I didn't see that clause. It was kind of deep in the contract. Wait, did you not read it? He asked. I assume you did. Well, I did. But there's no excuse not to read it. This is how you got stop loss twice. Shut up. Neither of us are talking. Milk was spared from further teasing by the voice calling out first, Ryan Joseph Kennedy, and then... I'll... I'll... I've... Milk stood up, rolling her eyes, as someone butchered her name once more. The pair walked over to the lizard-skinned lady manning the desk. Just call me Milk. Everyone does. Ivine said with a jaunty wink, causing the lizard lady to flush before she rallied and handed over a pair of packages. Cadet jacket, patches, and a signed tablet. You will keep this tablet throughout your basic training and be required to turn it over at the end, don't lose it, the alien said. The Omnis has basic regulations, scheduling and patch application, along with trivia you'll be tested on at various points. Welcome to the Shavanti Imperium Navy, she finished, in a much too cheery voice before a pair of soldiers waved the two forward. Wonder if food will be better this time around, Cookie mused, as they were marched onto a massive vessel and shown assigned seats. The pair were lucky enough to be sharing a cabin, along with a handful of other cadets, the only humans Cookie saw on the entire ship. As he threw his bundle of stuff onto the sleeper berth, top bunk obviously, he mused that he was probably one of 20 men on the entire one and a half kilometer long ship. So, humans, one of their bunkmates said, leaning out from her bed. 
She was tall, like Ushavanti, and all curves. Cookie wasn't much one for women, he swam the other way. But the way he saw milk drink in her form, he could assume the lady was very aesthetically pleasing. See so you got cadet jackets. Patrol? Cookie nods. Send to training. You? He asks, hopping up onto his bunk and beginning to sort his kit away in the provided. Darpy kit. Folding razor, rosary, water bottle, survival blanket, box with wings, theotokos, and a handful of other items on the packing list. And a deck of cards. Technically contraband, but Cookie wasn't a new hand at smuggling things past the instructors. Shipping off the basic as well. Parents are working in logistics, so I was dragged along and... Well, I wasn't waiting until I got back to Karkata to enlist. She snaps her fingers. Oh, right. Uh, my name is Ronnery Gwenabri. Yours? Milk looks over to Cookie. You first, Cookie says. My name is Ivy McDermott, Milk said. But you can call me Milk. There was a pause. Ivy? Close. Ivy. Uh, how is that spelled? It won't help. Cookie, your turn. Cookie rolls his eyes. Ran Brooks Joseph Kennedy. I also go by Cookie. The other Shulvanti in the bunk grinned. I can see why. Cookie held up a gold band around his finger. Brought a few weeks ago for this exact purpose. Taken. My wife would castrate me if I went with another woman. Human thing. A loss for all of us. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Cookie replies. That's not why I'm called it. When Milk and I graduated NFS, Naval Flight School, one of our wingmates noticed that my uncle had written, He's a good cookie, on my recommendation to the Naval Academy. There were blank looks. Calling someone a good cookie is a patronizing way of calling them a decent person. It took them a second, but they laughed. Yeah, but by how hard you drink, we'd never tell a good Catholic boy rested below that button-down shirt. Milk replied with a grin. Cookie snorted. Who's wearing stones here, Paddy? The slur blanted by familiarity between the two. We went shot to shot, and you drank half the bar under the table. It's my good Irish genes that give me supernatural alcohol tolerance, she laughed before the ship shuddered. We're new, that normal. And then things began to float. This is your captain speaking. A voice came over the intercom. I would like to welcome all our new cadets to the glorious Chauvanti Navy. As my duty as captain is to ensure that all crew members are trained, I shall teach you the best advice you could be given when malingering in my vessel. Milk and Cookie looked at each other with wide eyes, as Aroni used the lower gravity to leap into her bunk and grabbed on firmly to the handholds inside. Three points of contact. Captain Sengati Devard Molufna had an interesting sense of preparation. She'd run drills of every kind, have crewmates break into bunks with stun guns and shoot anyone who didn't lock their door. Shut off gravity and then slam it back on to make sure all crew had their mag boots tight. And then, there were the lectures. Milk sat, separate from Cookie for once, in the massive lecture hall staring at a captured consortium anti-shipping missile. It was easily taller than most of the crew, probably twice her height. A 13 foot long rocket with a core of roiling plasma and an armor-piercing head. This, grad riders and assorted crew, the captain began in her mostly faux snooty nobility voice, is an anti-shipping missile. It's used by consortium drone fighters to punch holes in the hull of our vessels and throw the poor cunts within its radius into the cold darkness of space. Pop quiz! What do you do if the vessel you're on has been hit by an anti-shipping missile? She pointed at a Rakiri cadet who fidgeted at the wrong moment. The cadet blanked before spouting off the standard safety drill for sealing a vacuum exposed area. Wrong! You! She pointed at another cadet, who said something about returning fire through the new firing port. Why the fuck aren't you a marine? Wrong! She pointed at Milk. Milk stammered. A uh, prey? She guessed. No points for half credit. If you feel your ship get hit by one of these, you hold on tight and pray, because there is never a single drone fighter flying against you. If a single missile slips past your defences, there will be twenty more, and then you're in space and praying to the goddess and gods that you remember to check your void seals. That put the cadets in a somber mood. Who here is patrol? 
she asked. Who's going to be flight interceptors? About a third of the present cadets raised their hand. Your mission, when you're deployed with the Navy, will boil down to fighting drone ships, drones and torpedoes, and blowing them out of our void. You do not go after full ships. We have full ships for that. Your goal is making sure we don't run into a bomb somewhere, or get swarmed by missiles. Now, before anyone asks, yes, we have point defence guns. They work. And since I'm lucky enough to sit behind a good few metres of Imperial armour, and not the flexibate cans that you interceptor pilots fly, let's talk gunnery. At that, Bilk zoned out. Two weeks into the journey, Cookie finally asked for a star map. And then probably asked for a technical manual to figuring out how in God's name to read it. The crisscrossing lines of transportation, the fact it was a 3D hologram, the fact that half a dozen systems were overlapping made his head hurt to look at. Some of the planets seemed close together and were merely missing a trade route until he turned the map and realised there was a massive asteroid belt, pirate held moon, or a black hole between them, needing the jig and jog between the systems to not make a cargo run a suicide mission. So Cookie began to cut things out. He removed everything not within a couple of systems of Earth and used his memory of how many times the jolt of the drive shunting off the plot how far they've gone. And then he began to check which routes were safer and headed deep into Shulvanti space. And then he began to pare down the different parts using rumour, bribery, and listening in on the crew discussing where they'd get their next food shipment. As he pushed on, and liberally got rid of everything he wasn't needing, he began to plot out their path. They were heading deep into Shulvanti held territory. If he had to guess, the Naval Training Academy would probably only be a few systems away from Shill itself maybe even in the same system of the homeworld. Guess I get to be an astronaut after all, Ryan commented to himself, surrounded by the low hum of a gravity drive and the sparkling lights of projected stars. One month, two weeks and three days later, Milk and Cookie walked off the naval transport vessel, all they owned slung over their backs to stand under an alien sun. The ground was marshy and brown, and a smell of a salty sea hit them with a blast of nostalgia the they didn't expect as they looked upon the massive, near continent spanning superstructure ahead of them. Cadets! A lady standing on top of a mech roared, her voice amplified by her armor and the speakers of the machine. Welcome to the Shovanti Imperium's naval training facility. Here you will be taught how to fight, sail, and serve in Her Majesty's glorious navy, or you will be sent home in a coffin. Instructors! Sort these scum out! The pilot shared a glance as a pack of massive, burly women in sharp uniforms screaming at the top of their lungs rushed at the terrified cadets from every angle, screaming at them to do as they say. Guess some things never change. <laughs>